honor our pastoral staff and not forget they hold that position to represent you. It's not their power, but it is your power that hopefully we're looking to you for those answers, that we're all looking to you. And I thank you, Lord, for this church family, for all the people that maybe can't make it here into this building that are online, for the people that are in this building, and for all the churches that are out worshiping you today, Lord, we thank you for them because they have been chosen by you and by being where they are and quieting their hearts and quieting their minds, they are listening to you for your guidance, Lord. Let it never go unnoticed that you are the one. You are the all-powerful. You are the one that we should be looking to. So we praise you, Lord, and let us not take for granted that you are there and you gave your son for us. So we quiet ourselves now, Lord, to hear Pastor Gene speak um, and come before and speak of Revelation. Let's not get lost in the details and let us go ahead and hear what it is that you want us to hear. You were the one that brought this book forward, so we need to pay attention. Anything that you want, Lord, we are your people and we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. This morning's scripture is from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. To the angel of the assembly in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars, which are the seven messengers of the seven churches in his right hand, who goes about among the seven golden lampstands, which are the seven churches. I know your industry and activities, laborious toil and trouble, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot tolerate wicked men, and have tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles, and yet are not, and have found them to be impostors and liars. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not fainted or become exhausted or grown weary. But I have this one charge to make against you, that you have left the love that you had at first. You have deserted me, your first love. Remember them from what heights you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did previously when you first knew the Lord, or else I shall visit you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you change your mind and repent. As you know, probably, it's Testimony Sunday, and uh, I'm going to share a, a brief word, but I also think I'm ready to retire from electronics because I really hate for the... We, we have been fighting this ghost in the machine for the last week and a half, and right now everything is running except the broadcast, believe it or not, so we'll figure it out. But anyways, many of you have been sharing, have been praying for my brother Paul. And uh, Paul had an MRI this week, and I would love to give the report that the cavity was clean. The cancer, as far as they can tell, is gone at this point. Now, this is a good, this is a good thing because obviously uh, the type of cancer my brother has is terminal. It will eventually come back, but what's happening right now is the treatment that he has been getting has been very, very aggressive, and it's been killing whatever cancer cells there is, and he's wearing a, uh, this funky bathing cap thing. It reminds me of my, what my mother used to wear on the beach in the 50s, um, but it's got all kinds of electronics and whatnot attached to it, and it's sending uh, impulses to that area of the brain where the, where the cancer was growing to kill the cells. So 
this is really, really good. Uh, it, everything stays the way it is. He could live another five or 10 years, you know, with God's grace. But my sister-in-law said to me, Mike, thank you for praying and tell your church thank you for praying. And I said, we're not done. We're not done. So people, testimony this morning, and you guys already know this, God does answer our prayers. God bless you, and thank you for praying for my brother. Thank you, Michael. You know, Mike, I know you said that eventually this disease will kill my brother. And I know that's what the doctors are saying, but you know what? We have a God who certainly, if he chose to, could cure him. And so he wouldn't die of this affliction. Well, this is where I usually say, welcome to Living Hope Church, and I greet the people who are watching us online, and I guess they're not watching us online today, at least not yet. Well, we are in our second sermon series on Revelation. So today we kind of get into the meat of this sermon series because we're going to be looking at the seven churches. And today we look at the first church. We're going to look at them in order. So if you want to just read ahead of time what we're going to be preaching on, just go to Revelation and read those first three chapters. You know, I would suggest probably read them every week. All right? Read, the, read them every week because this week... We're talking about the first church, which is Ephesus. Now, you could probably tell by the beginning of what Beth read for us that Ephesus used to be or was a great church. Ephesus did a lot of things right. And Jesus encourages the church in the beginning of this statement about what they did right. Now, I want to remind you that this is Revelation, that this book is different from all the other books in Scripture. I talked about this last week, that all the other books, the prophet or apostle or evangelist, whoever was the author of the book, they wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote in their own words. The Holy Spirit, I am sure, aided them with memory, aided them with what was the focus, what's important, but they wrote in their own words what was going on. In Revelations, it's different. God gave this to Jesus, who gave it to his angel, who gave it to John. This book, in a sense, is being dictated by God to the apostle. That's a very different approach. Very, very different. And when you think about it, and I think I said this last week, it makes sense, because how could John be writing about what's going to happen thousands of years later? John would have no idea what's going to happen in 2022. Now, we don't want Jesus coming back, but John can no way have been writing 3,000 years in advance. That, he couldn't do that. He was getting told what to write by the angel who got the information from Christ, who got it from the Father. All right, so this is a different kind of book. So like I said, the church had been a great church at Ephesus, but they had a problem. And you can see the problem right on the screen behind me. It says they lost their first love. Now, what was the first love? Well, their first love was Jesus, of course. And if that can happen to them, the church at Ephesus, I want to propose to you today and help you today come up with ways that we can make sure it won't happen to us. All right? So let me begin with a little fun. Someone had once asked a bunch of elementary age children, what they think about love. What does love mean to them? I want to give you some of their answers. For example, Glenn, age seven. Glenn says this, if falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't want to do it, it takes too long. <laughs> now, okay. And Regina, age 10, says, I'm not rushing into love, I'm finding fourth grade hard enough. Now we come to Angie. Angie's probably my favorite because she represents a modern-day uh, liberal female in our culture. And she's 10, so I can imagine what her mother's like. This is what she says. 
Most men are brainless, so you may have to try more than once to find a live one. Uh, and like I said, I can just imagine what Angie's mother is like just by reading her a quote about love. David, age eight, says, love will find you, even if you're trying to hide from it. I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but girls kept finding me. And the last one I want to go over is Manuel, age eight. Manuel says this, I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something, but the rest of it isn't supposed to be painful. Well, as Manuel gets a little older, he'll find out that love can be painful, right? So that's what elementary school children think about love. Now, what about science? So I'm going to go from one extreme to the other. What does science have to say, modern science, about love? Science tells us when people are in love, their brain lights up. I'll explain that in a minute. They said that when you're in love, your eyes light up, your face lights up, and it says, so do four small parts of your brain. They did a research at the University, of, University College in London, and what they said, there are some very common denominators about love in every human being. They said when they tested subjects and showed all of the subjects pictures of their sweetheart, that certain areas of their brain instantly lit up. And of course, that meant there was a higher flow of blood going to those four small areas of the brain. They said it happened with everyone. And they also said something else interesting happened when they showed these pictures to those people, that there was reduced area or reduced blood going to three large areas of the brain that are associated with depression. And they said, that's just a scientific fact. These four areas of your brain light up because you're getting more blood flow. And these three large areas of your brain, they kind of have less activity because they're getting less blood flow. And those areas are all the ones related to depression. In our text this morning, Jesus is rebuking the church at Ephesus. Now, in Della's prayer today, she said something like, I'm going to paraphrase, you know, when we get into Revelation, you know, let's, let's get into what's important. And, and she didn't say, forget the small stuff, but that's the way I heard it. I know she didn't say it that way. So today, I'm just going to focus on the big stuff from the church of Ephesus. And the big thing is this, they've lost something. And we all know what that is, their first love. And Jesus rebukes them for it. Let me read you from the NIV what Jesus says. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. Now, let me stop there. He's saying, nevertheless, I have this against you, because he just, he just commended them for all these good things that they had done. He said, you did this, it was good. You did this, it was good. You did this, it was good. Then he says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else... I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. It's kind of like Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus, your brain no longer lights up when you think about me. No longer does that. How did that happen? How does somebody lose their first love? That's an important question for us here this morning. If I'm going to give you advice how not to lose your first love, how does it happen in the first place? I mean, do you lose your first love like you lose a set of keys? Or you lose the TV remote? Is that kind of how it happens? Well, let me say the answer to that question is this. Um, yeah, yeah, and no both at the same time. I've known people who have lost their first love. We had a pastor here, Mary Ann. Some of you know Mary Ann, right? Mary Ann was on staff working towards ordination. She comes in one day and she tells us she no longer loves Jesus. She thinks that he's phony. He never existed and that she's going to go off and follow her own path in life, basically exploring other religions in the occult. She was on staff here as a pastor. She lost her first love. I mean, I, it was kind of stunning to all of us who were on staff. Like, what? What are you talking about? She told me, because I had a private conversation with her, she said, Gene, you've drank the Kool-Aid. I said, what Kool-Aid? The Christian Kool-Aid. Because there's no such thing as Jesus. Okay? Now, she lost her first love, clearly. 
Let me tell you how people lose their first love. They don't wake up one morning and say, oh, today I'm not going to love Jesus anymore. No one does that. No Christian would ever do that. And in fact, if they give it any thought at all, if they realize that it even had happened, they might say that their love for Jesus was missing. Was missing. They would say it feels like they've misplaced that love and they don't know where Jesus went. Well, let me tell you this. This is a fact. People don't misplace their love for Jesus ever. They replace their love for Jesus. They don't misplace it. They replace it. That's how this works. It's like the man who loses his love for his wife and runs off with another woman. Most adulterers don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, everything's going great, but today I'm going to leave my husband or wife. That's ridiculous. Of course it never happens that way. I once had a man and his fiance come into my office about 15 years ago and want me to marry them. They had both been through divorces, and so I take marriage very serious. I asked them what happened in the divorces, as I always would with any couple. And she explained what happened to hers, and he said, well, we just fell out of love. I said, how long were you married? Five years. When did you fall out of love? Around year three. How'd that happen? I don't know. We just fell out of love. And by the dismissive way he answered my question, I knew this. He would fall out of love with that lady sitting next to him as well. And I wanted nothing to do with marrying them, and I told them so. He was telling me, basically, he just lost his love for his wife, kind of like he lost his keys. It didn't bother him in the least. But see, I doubt he misplaced his love for his wife. More than likely, he found someone else who replaced her love. This reminds me of a seminar I was at 15, 20 years ago. It was preachers. I'm trying to think. I'm not sure if I was ordained then or not. Maybe I was. And this seminar was conducted by a counselor. And this is what he said. April is here today, and I warned her about this part of the sermon. This is what the counselor said. The counselor said this. Pastors, be aware of your church secretaries. That's what he said. And he said it because I have known many pastors who've run off with their secretaries. And he said, what would happen with all the pastors he knew was exactly the same? He said the secretary would come into the office, they would do something nice for the preacher, and he would compliment her. Then later on, she'd do something else for the preacher, and he would compliment her again. And then she started thinking something like this. If only my husband would treat me like that at home. And the pastor started thinking something like this. If only my wife would treat me like that at home. And eventually he said they would run off together, only to find out about six months later that the person they ran off with was exactly the same as the person they'd left behind. Now, that's not going to happen here. Mike, Jim, Gene, and Della are not going to run off with April. Okay, I can assure you of that. I can assure you of that. All right, it's just not going to happen. But this is not that unusual. It's not like this never happens. It does happen. You know, it happens because you allow someone else or something else to take the place of Jesus. Now, this is a cautionary sermon. And what I mean by a cautionary sermon is this. We don't have that problem here at Living Hope. However... Jesus rebuked the church at Ephesus for this, and that's where we are. We're at the church of Ephesus in Revelation. And this had once been a great church. You remember that Paul wrote a letter to the book at Ephesus. It's called Ephesians. Paul wrote this church. You know what Paul said in that letter? How great the church was. There was no condemnation from Paul whatsoever. All he did was compliment the church and encourage the church. So when Paul wrote this letter to Ephesians, this church was doing pretty good. It was doing really well. They hadn't lost their first love yet. Remember, Revelation was written long after Ephesians was written. All right? So this church was an influential, important church. And Paul commends this congregation very highly. So if losing your first love can happen to a church like Ephesus, it can happen to you, it can happen to me, 
it can happen to our church. I've seen preachers lose their first love. I have seen churches lose their first love. Friends, this can happen to any of us. So the question is not if it could happen. The question is how do we, how do I protect myself from this danger? And that's what I want to spend the rest of the sermon on. Giving you tools, telling you how this happens, why this happens, and, and tools to make sure it doesn't happen to you, to me, or to our church. And I'll tell you, the answer is found in one simple statement from Jesus. One small statement from the Sermon on the Mount answers the question to how to avoid this. It's going to sound so simple when I tell you. And you're going to say, well, that's really a no-brainer. And I'm going to tell you, no, it's not a no-brainer because it happens to people. Jesus, is, Jesus said to us in Matthew 6, he said this, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what's the secret? To never losing your first love is always, always, always keep God, his kingdom, and his righteousness in first place. That is the way to avoid replacing our love for Jesus. And again, like I said, you say, well, Pastor Gene, that's not an epiphany. We all know that. Really? Well, how did anyone ever lose their first love? How did the whole church at Ephesus lose their first love? How did Mary Ann lose her first love? If that's such a no-brainer and everyone, everyone follows that and does that, it's not a no-brainer. Okay? Not at all. Now, I could cover all kinds of ways that people let something replace Jesus. I'm going to focus on just three today. And be clear, these are not the only three ways that people replace Jesus in their lives, but I think they're three of the most common ways that people do it. The first thing you could replace Jesus with, with your affections, is you. You may think, what? Well, let me explain it this way. The Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God. I think that's not a surprise to any of you. And that biblical reality has a strange side effect to it. Not too long ago, researchers did a survey, and they asked a number of folks some questions about how they viewed God. They asked them what they thought of God's priorities, what, what about God's view of mankind. Then they took those same exact people and asked them another series of questions, and those questions were how would they describe themselves and their own priorities, et cetera, et cetera. And these researchers found something very intriguing after they put all the data together. What they found was this, that how subjects viewed God was remarkably similar, like how they viewed themselves. In other words, these folks tend to view God, or people tend to view God, as an extension of themselves. Now, on the surface, I would say that's not necessarily a bad thing. That is until folks begin to develop what I call, and what is called by counsel, is a God fixation. And that's what people begin to think, that God is like them. And that he thinks like them, he has the same priorities as they do, he has the same objectives as they do. And when that happens, folks begin to think like this. Well, any decision that I make, well, that's God's decision. Right? I mean, because God and I think the same. I'm his follower, so whatever I think and whatever I want to do, that's what God wants to do. Now, there are church members who get this God fixation. And see, they don't have to listen to God. And they don't have to listen to Jesus. And you know why? Jesus listens to them. And you may think this is silly. All right? But if they don't get their way, someone is going to pay. And the reason is, this is all not on purpose. This is all because they're speaking for Jesus. So they're speaking for Jesus. And therefore, you know, what they're saying is right. I had this... Uh, I, I experienced this firsthand in my family, firsthand, right here at Living Hope. I'm going to tell you a story without naming names, except I'm going to name my mother-in-law. Elsie, you awake? Elsie, are you awake? No? Okay. 
Well, I'm going to talk about you right now, so you may want to be awake for this part, and you can correct anything I say if I'm incorrect. A number of years ago, I can't tell you how long ago, and I can't even tell you the issue. The issue either was De Palma, something, I mean, not De Palma, something to do with building the new parsonage or something to do with Elliott Street Church. I don't know what, it, what issue it was. It was one of those two issues. And the church was having an all-church vote about one of those issues. And the church voted, and it was 28 to 2. 28 people said yes, two people said no. And what had happened is Elsie got a phone call from someone in the church who was upset and asked her why she voted no. That's not the right thing to do. You shouldn't vote no. Now, Elsie told the person, I didn't vote no. They didn't believe her. Now, let me tell you what happened. I know who voted no, Linda and I. I voted no because I knew things you guys didn't know about what was going on. If you knew what I knew, you probably would have voted no as well. But, so I know who the two votes were. I was 100% sure. I voted no, and Linda voted no. I knew Elsie voted yes. So this person calling her up and giving her a hard time had no idea what they were talking about. But yet, you're wrong for voting no. That is bordering on a God fixation. I'm right, you're wrong. We have private votes in the Church of the Nazarene for a reason, right? They're, they're private. No one knows who votes when we vote. They're supposed to be that way. But I experienced this when someone in the church got very upset that Elsie voted no, and she was not right. And when I, I by the way, I, I talked to this person, I called this person, I told this person that I voted no, and my wife voted no, and asked this person if they wanted to yell at me. They didn't. Um, and so friends, this, this can be a problem. We can be the problem. Now how do you know if you're falling into this trap of uh, this God fixation? Because no one does it on purpose. Well, if you catch yourself saying, this is my church, that gets a little bit iffy at that point because we know it's not my church, it's Jesus' church. And I can understand you saying, I belong to this congregation, so it's my church. But these folks take that kind of statement to a whole new level. You know, but that phrase doesn't have to be said. If you catch yourself getting upset with a church decision and then making sure others know of your displeasure and you work at making the lives of others uncomfortable, people who do that are on their way to losing their first love they have replaced Jesus with themselves. And that's never a good thing. Okay, another area where people replace Jesus with themselves is with their family. Now, I hope you're not hearing this verse for the same time from Matthew 10, 37, but it says this. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy worthy of me. That's Jesus speaking, by the way. Those are his words. And if you're hearing this for the first time, and you're saying, this, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's Jesus saying? I shouldn't love my family? No, that's not what he's saying at all. The Bible is crystal clear. It says a man is to love his wife. A father should not provoke his children to anger. And a man is to provide properly for his family. And if a man doesn't do these things, he's worse than an infidel. The Bible repeatedly drives home the fact that we should love our families. But what Jesus is saying is this. Let me be clear. He is saying if you love your family more than him, you've got your priorities out of whack. Because if Jesus comes second to your family, sooner or later, Jesus is going to have to bow down at the altar of your family. Now, how will you know if you put your family ahead of Jesus? Again, ask yourself some questions. Is church a priority? Or do other activities take precedent? I mean, what if you need to be out of town and you can't come to church here? What about that? I mean, we have several people who every year show up at our church at the same time. There's one guy from Florida that I'm thinking of right now. He comes to our church the same time every year. He's on vacation. His mother lives in the area. I think that's why he comes here comes to a completely strange church that he saw us online, but he comes every year, and you know why? He loves Jesus, and he's not going to miss church because he's away on vacation. Okay, what about you? What about you? Second, 
do you make sure your children know how important it is to go to church with you? Now, listen, when your children, I'm not talking about when they're married and they have kids and they're on their own, they're not living with you, but I'm talking about your four, five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old children. Do you let them know it's important to go to church with you? In fact, as a parent, do you just make an edict? They are going to church, period. I know some people would say, well, if they do that and they, don't, and they go there and they don't want to be there, they're not going to get anything out of it. I say bring them anyways. That's what I would say as a parent. All right. George Washington had a very similar view. This is what George Washington's pastor said. Quote, no company ever kept him away from church. I have often been at Mount Vernon on the Sabbath morning when his breakfast table was filled with guests. But to him, they furnished no pretext for neglecting his God and losing the satisfaction of setting a good example. Instead of staying home out of an imaginary courtesy to them, he used to constantly to invite them to accompany him." End quote. So basically, if you visited President Washington on Sunday morning and you didn't plan to go to church, you had to figure out what to do with yourself because he was going with or without you, period. Number three. At family gatherings, do you talk about your faith? Or do you refrain from talking about your faith because you're afraid you're going to alienate them? The best way to ensure that Jesus is always first, first, is to put him first ahead of your family. And I know that's hard to do. That's something we have to do consciously, okay? Um, It's hard to do. Another thing that folks replace their first love for Jesus with is simply one word, stuff. Stuff. You know what stuff is. Stuff is the stuff that clutters up your life. At Living Hope Peabody, we had a really kindly old woman who had stacks of stuff all over her house. She was a hoarder. So if you went to her front door to get back to her easy chair, you had to walk through an aisle that was created with stacks of stuff that was multiple, multiple feet high. We tried to help her. I, we, uh, I don't know how many people from the church went over. A lot of people from the church went over one day, and we decided we were going to clean her house. And the biggest thing was keeping her away from where we were cleaning. Because you would go in a room, and the room would just, you, you couldn't see chairs. You couldn't see couches. There was just too much stuff. So I instructed, and I got, I'm not a hoarding expert or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, okay, I understand that. But I said to everyone, put everything in bags and throw it away. If we have to run to the dump ten times, just throw everything away. I don't care what it is. I don't care how valuable it is. We're not having a yard sale. We're not putting this. Just throw everything away. Well, that went over. It could have gone over better, okay? So that's what we did. We just started throwing stuff out, bags and bags and bags and bags of stuff. And so when I look out the window, we're on the third floor. What do I see? I see her down at the street, opening up all the bags, going through the bags, trying to take stuff out of the bags that we're throwing out. Again, it's, it's an affliction that I didn't really understand back then. I understand the psychological part of hoarding much more than I do now. But this stuff was cramping her physical life. I mean, you couldn't live in her apartment, but she did. She shouldn't have lived there. I'm surprised she didn't go through the floor with all the weight of the stuff she had. Okay? So, um, but that can happen. You know? Now, that was her stuff. But in the same way, Christians often let stuff clutter up their own lives, and stuff can block their love for Jesus. Some folks complain they're too tired to get up to go to church on Sunday morning. Others complain they have to go to work on Sunday, and they just can't make it to church. Or there'll be other activities that deprive them from Sunday worship so they don't go anywhere. That is the stuff of life. I get it. That is the stuff of real life. That's the kind of stuff, real stuff, that can get in our way in our love for Jesus Christ. And after a while, these same people find themselves not going to church at all and then drifting away from God. Now, I want to go back to the early church and how things were in the early church, because many of us don't think, what was it like for them to go to church back in Jesus' day? What was it like for them to go and worship Jesus? Well, let me say, first I'll say this. Maybe you didn't realize this, but in those days, it was common, you didn't get Sundays off. Everyone worked seven days a week except for the Jews. 
The Jews worked six days a week. They did not work on Saturday. So Jews aside, everyone else worked seven days a week. So everyone had to work on Sunday or whatever day they chose to worship. Everyone had to work. So where did they get time to worship? Well, let me read you from Acts chapter 20. It says this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered. They were gathered on the first day of the week, so that would have been Sunday. They would have been gathered. And what time did they gather? Well, Paul was preaching until midnight. They didn't gather at 5. They gathered sometime later in the evening. Maybe they gathered at 9 or 10. Because he wasn't going to be done preaching until the next day. What were they doing? They said that they were breaking bread. In other words, they were having communion or celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now, Paul was there. We can take that for granted. And he was the preacher. But really, the highlight of the evening, the real meat of the evening, was communion. They may have studied scripture. They may have prayed. But every week, they gather on Sunday night to take the Lord's Supper to honor the sacrifice that Jesus made on their behalf. Now, why would they go so much out of their way? Why would they be in church at midnight when they have to get up at 5 in the morning to go to work the next day? Why was it? Because Jesus was first. Because they loved Jesus. Have you ever seen a teenager in love? Or do you remember back when you were, I don't know when you had your first love, if you ever had a big love. I had one when I was 14. But let's say you were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, maybe even young college kids. <clears throat> you ever see two kids who are madly in love with each other? You know, you can barely separate them, right? I mean, you just can't. They're with each other every moment of every day. And when they're not together, they're doing FaceTime or they're texting or they're talking on the phone. They are in love. They want to spend time together, a lot of time together. And they're concerned if they stop getting together, that they could lose their love for each other. If you love Jesus, my friends, you'll make time for him. Now, people who don't make time for Jesus, many of them over time just drift away, little by little. Now, if you didn't know this, let me remind you of something. You don't need me to worship. You don't need the worship team to worship. You don't need to be in this building to worship. I hope you understand all that. You know, all you need is to get together with a couple of other Christians. It's not like you're going to go to hell if you miss church for a few weeks. I'm not implying that at all. Please don't think I'm implying that. This is not about church attendance. This is about losing your first love. Those are two different things. You may not come to church for the next 25 weeks and still have Jesus as your first love because you found a home group, because you're in the hospital, because there's some other thing going on. Okay, but if you are able to go to church and you are healthy, you belong in church, period. You belong in church. Um, the issue is this, the more stuff that you allow to clutter up your life, the further you're going to drift from Christ. And my point is this, closeness to Jesus is what speaks of our love for him. To illustrate, I'm going to read arguably the most famous Christian poem written in the last 50 years. I'm not going to apply it the way you think, but I'm sure you know it. I can't imagine anyone here doesn't know this poem, but I'm going to read it anyways. But you're certainly familiar with the picture that is associated with this poem. One night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me 
So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest, the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you, never, ever, during your trials and testing. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then when I carried you. You know the poem, right? It's called Footprints. And so popular, people use it as art in their office, in their home. They put up the picture, something like that. And sometimes the poem is written on the picture. Sometimes it's not even any words. Why does this poem mean so much to so many people? Because it talks about God's love for us. Now, friends, I hope that's never in question for you. I hope none of you question whether or not God loves you. That should not be a question that you wrestle with. Should not be. And if you do wrestle with that question, talk to someone who loves God. Talk to someone who loves Jesus. Because that should be something that gives us strength and adds to our faith that we know, no matter what we're going through, God is with us, God loves us, God never leaves us, doesn't forsake us, God loves us even when we don't love him. So the question is never, does God love us? The question is, do we love him? Do we love him? Has America lost its first love? Let me show you a news article from this week. This is in the USA Today. A couple days ago, Texas school district pulls over 40 books, including the Bible, from shelves amid review. They're taking the Bible off the shelves in school. 17th, what was that, three days ago? I read, this, I read the whole article, but I'm just showing you the headline of the article. It was in USA Today. Has America lost their first love? I can't imagine the Bible being banned from schools. It's unimaginable to me, but here we are. That's exactly what they are doing. Exactly. In America, the Bible being banned. I think America has lost its first love, as a general statement. Now, not all Americans, but America, generally speaking, has. We've lost our first love. Here's a great example from this week's news. Friends, the church at Ephesus, like I said, was a great church. They weren't a good church. They were a great church. And somehow along the way, over a period of 10 or 20 years, they lost their first love. What got in the way? Was it family? Was it themselves? Was it stuff? Was it the culture? Something slowly and gradually took away, little by little by little, their focus on Jesus. And they got to a place where God himself, who's not wrong in his evaluation, God said to them, you lost your first love. And if God says that, they did. This is not in question. They did. And I would tell you, they didn't want to. I would say, none of them wanted to. It just happened. Over the last couple hundred years in America, this hasn't happened overnight. This has happened with decision and decision and decision over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years. America was built on the promises of Scripture. Our Constitution was written as, with the Bible being its model. The Bill of Rights was written with the Bible being its model. And if you didn't know that, go look it up. I'm not just saying these things. Those are factual. With the Constitution being modeled after the Bible, and here we're going to say the Bible can no longer be read in schools or even put in the library shelves. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you, God, with your patience for us as a nation. I thank you, God, how you have blessed us as a nation. And I pray, God, that a time is coming real soon when revival will come and this country will turn back to you. 
for wisdom, guidance, salvation. And then in doing so, God, we can go back to being the moral leaders for the world. Showing the world what it looks like to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So I pray, God, for us as a local church that we could do that in this community. That we could represent you well. That we could be ambassadors for Christ wherever we go. That we would never be ashamed to tell someone about the love of Christ. That we would be quick to point them to you. That we would let them know that we will pray for them. Regardless if we're in a work situation or a school situation or it's our neighbor. That we wouldn't back away from telling people about our first love. So God, thank you for this reminder from this church at Ephesus, a good church. And Father, I don't know where they ended up. I don't know if they came back to you. We're not sure. We don't know. I do pray, God, and hope that they did. And I ask, God, that we would never get into the place here at Living Hope where we have to come back to you, but that we would just never leave you in the first place. So thank you, God, for this word today. Thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for your patience. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For that good word, Pastor Gene. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Above all, close yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. And that's the key word for our offering. We give it out of thankful hearts. Let us, let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we acknowledge everything we have has been provided by you. With love and thankful hearts, we present our tithes and offerings to you. May they be used to build and strengthen your church here in Beverly and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand for our closing song. Jesus 
justice all will renew your name forever faithful and true jesus is god Father, we are grateful for the fact that you are coming again. And as we study the book of Revelation, God, and some of Revelation points to that time, that day, I pray, God, that all of us will not as much focus on the day, that, but that we will be prepared every day, that we be prepared today for you to come and tomorrow for you to come, God. And there will never come a day where we aren't ready for the return of Jesus Christ, to come to earth and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. There'll be no question whether or not you are real or alive. What a wonderful day and a glorious day for those who are followers of yours. So God, we give ourselves to you and we pray that as we go into a world that is desperate, that has lost their first love a long time ago for Jesus Christ, that we could show them, demonstrate for them, tell them about the love of Jesus God and maybe this week that you would give us someone to present the gospel to and someone would bend a knee. And the angels in heaven would rejoice because a sinner has repented. So we give ourselves to you, God, and just say, Lord, use us any way that you deem fit in the coming week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>